All right, so I think we could get started. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm John Choi, and I'm the Ramsey County Attorney. And um, uh, today, I'm here to uh, defend the decision uh, of my office and the actions that it's taken in a case that resolved uh, this morning uh, at a sentencing hearing in Ramsey County. I I'm also very lucky, because I, uh, just on very short notice, I you know, told some of my uh, friends and colleagues who um, also are elected officials about kind of what was going on. And uh, they have chosen uh, to be here uh, with me because they want to stand in support of uh, uh, the things that I'm going to be talking about. And also, more importantly, uh, to push back a little bit um, with respect to what the police union uh, is wanting, I believe, what, the pub what they want the public to believe about what this case is about and what it represents. Because I think there's a lot of things that have been portrayed that just really are unfair and they're not true. And I think we um, uh, should use this opportunity to really have a really thoughtful conversation about some of the issues that are raised because I think they're really important for our future and who we are as a community. Um, I also really want to make it just absolutely clear uh, at the outset of uh, my remarks that we should turn off our cell phones. <laughs> <laughs> No, but actually, that, that, that cell phone was actually a, a, an alert to make sure that you uh, are very mindful about this in your reporting, because I really want this to be reflected. Uh, this, I, I have absolutely no doubt that in this particular situation, that the officers uh, were in a dangerous situation, like they, they are in many, many times, and that they had uh, the fear that they articulated that they could be killed. I don't doubt that. I also think that the police officers exhibited great restraint in this situation because it could have been a, a very, very different one. So I, I want for sure that you are hearing me on, on that, okay? But I stand here today because I have to respond to uh, the things that uh, the police union um, articulated in terms of um, how they see this. And I think it's also an important opportunity to express what I believe are our shared values uh, in this community. And uh, these friends here who are here today, and I should actually uh, tell you who is standing here, I forgot to do that, but uh, our Chief Public Defender, Jim Fleming, Ramsey County Commissioner, Tony Carter, uh, City Council Member, Rebecca Naker, City Council Member Jane Prince, who just walked in the door, um, our board chair, Jim uh, McDonough, and uh, to my left is uh, County Commissioner Rafael Ortega, uh, Jessica McConney, who is representing the City of St. Paul, who is the interim chief deputy city attorney, uh, Representative Carlos Mariani, who chairs the Public Safety Committee in our House of Representatives, uh, County Commissioner Trista Matas Castillo, and um, Council Member Chris Tolbert. Uh, and so a part of all of this is I, I think we really want to articulate what we think are values of this um, community and what we ought to be doing around uh, public safety and criminal justice. You know, one of the most fundamental principles of being a prosecutor uh, is to do this job with this important value of independence and being willing to do the right thing without fear or favor. Earlier today, the police union took this extraordinary step of calling a press conference and calling into question the way that a particular case was handled. Presumably, their position is that we have jeopardized the safety of officers, that we have jeopardized the safety of our community by not pursuing this case as they would like it to be handled. They're the people who are on the front lines every day who respond to these situations. They investigate crimes, and they present the information and the evidence to us. Ultimately, the prosecutor has a very, very independent role. It's to ensure that what is presented to us is accurate, 
uh, and to figure out what needs to be done in the context of a criminal prosecution. And the way that they would like us to handle this case is that we would handle it without regard to our ethical obligations. A prosecutor uh, should not be pursuing a criminal charge if they believe that they cannot prove this case beyond a reasonable doubt. And they are also, I think, suggesting that we ignore the consequences uh, to the person who was accused of this crime, the defendant in this particular case. The case uh, that we're talking about today was resolved by the prosecutor uh, as a gross misdemeanor of reckless handling of a firearm. And that was because that was all the facts could support, not the second degree felony assault charge in the terroristic threat charges that were originally charged. When police present a case to us, they provide written police reports. And oftentimes people are in custody and we have to make those decisions relatively quickly, within a matter of 48 hours, right? And so we did not have the benefit <coughs> of the police uh, body-worn camera. And so based upon our probable cause standards, we charged it as such. But thankfully, um, later in the process, uh, after receiving the body-worn camera, our prosecutor uh, had the chance to review that video. And he came to the conclusion that this was, uh, that what was articulated by the police in the reports was a not entirely corroborated uh, and supported by what was depicted in addition, uh, the prosecutor was also mindful of our collateral consequences policy uh, as he thought about this particular case and uh, the possibility of immigration deportation. So at this time, what I'd like to do, and none of the people up here and the members of the public have not seen the video. And so I think the first thing that we should do is to actually view it. And so I would like, uh, Dennis, if you could, to come up here and show the video. There are two videos. Each is less than two minutes. So that's how I knew it was probably this one. Yeah, right behind you. Come out now. Get down on the fucking ground. Get on the ground. Get on the ground. I got to sit and go, boss. Get out here. Put your hands up. Put your hands up and come out of the house. I got to keep her. Keep her going. I got to sit and go, boss. Doesn't matter. Put your hands behind your back. Get inside the house. Come on out with your hands up. One more video. One more. 
And by the way, this is, uh, information is going to be available to all of you, the public, uh, on our website. Is it just a different angle, different body cam? All of this happened around 3 o'clock in the morning, about 2.50 a.m. actually to be exact. Uh, there was a complaint about noise. And as you see, what's happening there is, is that uh, the officers arrived to respond to that. And of course, officers are called to do these things that are oftentimes uncertain, dangerous. And so the knock that you heard was not preceded by any type of, this is the police, right? And I think it also is important to note like, who this person is and where he is from. This person uh, grew up in Texas. He's a licensed permit to carry holder. And these are all things, by the way, that the jury would hear, right? And so from his perspective, this is at 3 o'clock in the morning when someone knocks on the door. From his perspective, that's how uh, he would answer that door. But as you see in that video, in less than one second, as soon as he realizes that it's the police at the door, he takes measures to move the gun down on the ground and to put his hands up and to comply with all of the officer's commands. He apologizes to the officers in the squad car. Um, from his perspective, um, he, he was protecting himself. This is kind of what they do in Texas, I guess. And he also had thought that, because he was in, a, in St. Paul, he had heard that this is a, a dangerous area. That's what he articulated. And so, where is the criminal intent in terms of a second degree assault or terroristic threats? Our prosecutor identified that and said this is the problem. What this really is is more of a different type of level of offense. And then also too, uh, recognizing also that if we were to proceed, because in some offices across the country, this might be the case. They might just do whatever the police want them to do. And in this particular case, if we were to proceed, he consulted uh, with our immigration attorney, our collateral consequences attorney, because that's what our policy requires uh, our prosecutors to do if they think uh, this is something that uh, should be considered. 
And the advice that he had gotten was that this would have uh, certainly uh, consequences for potential removal from this country. And that's exactly what a prosecutor is supposed to do. They're supposed to think about doing the right thing despite the fact that a victim or a special interest wants you to handle a case that in a different way, we have to think about justice. We have to think about what our ethics say. Our ethics tell us that um, in those situations, uh, we don't proceed with those. Uh, and so then you have to think about doing something different. And so how he resolved the case was ultimately to resolve it as a gross misdemeanor. And that obviously was not accepted uh, by the police. But I want to just call out kind of what that all means. That so that somehow that we are going to be safer as a community by us ignoring our ethical standards and pursuing a case that we know that we cannot prove to ignore the fact that this person, if we were to do that, would have consequences that are completely unfair, not similar to anybody else in this particular situation. And this person has been in this country for uh, oh, about 25 years. He came to this country when he was seven years of age. And so all of those things in terms of what a minister of justice, what a prosecutor should be doing is exactly what this prosecutor did working with another prosecutor in this office. And they came to me with uh, their recommendation, which was just that, that they believe based upon provability issues, based upon um, thinking about uh, individuals who are coming into the system as human beings, and to think about the consequences to them, uh, that this is what they recommended. And I accepted that recommendation with, with enthusiasm. Because at the end of the day, this is the right thing to do. This is what prosecution offices uh, throughout the country should uh, be doing to pursue justice, not to pursue convictions, despite how much pressure or whatever uh, people might want to say. We have to do our work uh, without uh, fear or favor. Um, so with that, I, I think that um, I should stand for questions. If you have a question for uh, anybody here, um, certainly you know there's a lot of elected officials up here, but they certainly, I'm sure, would be willing to uh, provide any answers as well. John, you talk about safety and consequences for the suspect, but um, the police union feels like this is a message from the county attorney's office that they don't have your support. Well, why wouldn't why wouldn't they have my support? because I'm pursuing justice, right? And the way that I view my role is to, um, to be that minister of justice, to do the right thing. And if that means that I have to do what they want me to do uh, every time, that's not right. My role is to be independent of all of the various interests to think about what we should be doing as a community to enforce the rights of the public. And sometimes that means not enforcing certain things because we can't prove the case beyond a reasonable doubt because we think about some of the consequences so that they should be entirely calibrated. And quite frankly, I believe that that's how we actually have public safety in this community. When we have a justice system that's fair and just and, and calibrated the way that it needs to be. John, officers are asked to make split-second decisions when they're out on the job. Right. You said it took about one second for the man to realize that there were officers outside. If the police officers had fired their weapons and they saw that gun pointed at them, would that officer involved shooting be justified? Well, I think there would be more things to consider about that. So I'm not, that's, a, that's a very different question, and you're asking me to really speculate, so I'm not going to answer that. Into that. And so thankfully, we should all be uh, thankful that it did not. So John, I want to make sure we're clear on it and, and explain it correctly from, from right. your position based on what they said earlier today. In court, the judge, the defense, prosecuting attorney, acknowledged and the defendant acknowledged the 
Jesus actually could have gotten him killed, right? Right. Um, and when you see that video, as he comes through the door, as he opens the door, John, there looks like there's an arm extended. That's what I thought I saw. I wish I could have said, is that, was that his arm with the gun? Well, like that's, Do we know, or? well, Right, so if you freeze that video, right, you will see he comes up like this and he's bringing it down to get it down on the ground. So if you freeze frame a video, okay, so listen to me very carefully, okay, if you freeze frame a video of me jumping, it'll look like I'm flying, okay? You have to look at the totality of all of the circumstances, and I think a, a jury could easily come to the conclusion that what's happening here is that he's realizing that these are police officers, and um, he needs to rem right. get the gun down, comply, and keep everybody safe. And in fact, um, I don't know exactly what was said in court today, uh, but I've had a chance to re review um, the apology letter that he wrote, and I'll make certain that uh, you all have a copy of it because um, I think it's uh, pretty pretty uh, poignant in terms of what he says. So I was just trying to get to the point where, so what you're saying is everybody's in agreement that he comes to the door, the gun is here, but he goes here, correct? I'm just saying. Well, so our prosecutor... He comes here, gun goes here, and he drops. So what's articulated in the police report is that the, the gun was pointed at the officer. Our prosecutor came to the conclusion that that could not be entirely corroborated. Right. I'm not trying to say, I'm trying to understand at what point is that not a threat to the officer. I, do you see what I'm asking? If the gun's here and it's pointed at him, right. and that's been established, or it appears to be pointed at him. How do you not say that's a threat to the officer? Right. How, how does it, right, but it has to be, is this a second degree assault? assault. Is there an intent uh, to harm uh, the officer? Is this terroristic threats? I mean, Jim's an attorney. I mean, you can ask other experts out there, uh, but I don't know. It has to be an assault. He has to have done something in assault. The mere fact that he's bringing the gun down like that doesn't make it an assault. But so what I'm trying, to, I'm, I'm not trying to. I'm just trying to understand it. Right. Right. If I, if I'm somebody, not even a cop, and I see a gun pointed at me, I'm taking it as a threat. I don't know how else I would react to it as an assault. Right, and again, I want to be absolutely clear that we, I'm not questioning how the officer subjectively felt, right, that he was in fear of his life, all of that, not at all, but does that mean then because of uh, that situation, that fear, that we should just pull out the most uh, uh, the hammer and get the, the statute book out and look for the one that, you know. No, no, I just want to make sure in my reporting, I, can say, I just want to make sure when we report this, the gun was pointed at him, but what you're saying is there wasn't enough evidence, even though the gun was pointed at the officers or in their direction, there's not enough evidence to suggest it was an assault. That's a fair way to right. say Right, that's, that's, that's a fair way to say it, that's yeah. That's all I'm trying to get yeah. at. Yeah, right. Okay, Tim, uh, I, I want to ask a question in light of the yeah. before the Ramsey County Board yesterday. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you used the word collateral consequences, I don't mm -hmm. remember exactly, but yeah. it was along the same line. Mm -hmm. Right. Kind of hear you arguing today is, and I, I, I would like you to talk a little bit mm -hmm. about that. Sure. And I'm not sure, sure who those people were in the video behind him. Um, but what I kind of hear you saying today is even if none of that was true, mm -hmm. even if we didn't have this, this policy and this kind of road that you're trying to go on, you wouldn't have had evidence anyway. That's what you're saying. There, there right. Was, there, there sure. Was no evidence Absolutely. Anyway. There were two two things that the prosecutor had identified in terms of his rationale okay. of, of why the right thing to do, why, what justice would require. But regardless yeah. of what the right thing to do was, you're saying there would have been, wouldn't have been evidence anyway. That's right, what you're saying. right. So the deport, deportation played no role <coughs> in terms of deciding whether it was criminal. Right, is that what you're saying, John? In terms of the particular 
charge originally as charge, but it's certainly a thing that we want our prosecutors to be considering, and this particular prosecutor did everything that we are asking him to do as a part of the policy. Okay, last question. He's been here, he's been, Dennis, he's been here 27 years, did you say? Uh, to, uh, almost 25, yeah. So why but he came here at the age of seven. So why would he face deportation? Because he's, he's lawfully here as a legal resident. Oh. Um, but he's subject to removal. Okay. Well, we heard from police who really, you know, if they they felt like maybe you were more concerned about this guy getting deported than than the fact that their lives were at risk and this needs to be taken seriously when their lives are put at risk and they feel like they would put on a bulletproof vest and go to work every day and we risk our lives every day um, and um, and we did everything right. We de-escalated. It didn't end in the shooting. So we want to know that those people will be held accountable without concern for them being deported. Right. And what I'm telling you today is that that was one of the things that the prosecutor had in mind, but uh, the reason for the reduced charge and the plea negotiation that occurred uh, was because of the fact that the prosecutor identified provability uh, as uh, the issue as it relates to being able to proceed. I guess I'm asking why is the deportation thing even a concern? You know what I mean? Why is that even a factor? I think probably because uh, in the interest of transparency, the prosecutor told the uh, police what he was thinking, right? And then I guess that's kind of what they're all concerned about. Okay, last question then. We, we have a couple folks who are going to hang around for a little bit and answer some additional questions, but if there are additional questions, Um, they're friends of, I think one of the persons is a friend of uh, the, the person from Texas. Okay. Well, they didn't know the other people. Um, you know, I'm not, I don't want to speak to something that I'm not absolutely certain about. Um, I think it does matter though about like who this particular person is. He's a, a he has no criminal history, he's a commercial uh, truck driver and uh, he was in the midst of doing work, bringing cargo or something here to St. Paul from Texas. And he, I think his car, truck broke down and he was, uh, he was staying with some friends. Okay, thank you very much. <coughs> thank you. Oh, well, Jim, do you wanna say something? I'm sorry. Yep, I'm actually, sorry. yep, yeah. I Jim McDonough, Chair of the Board, and I just, I'm standing up here for a reason and I just wanted to take a few moments to make a comment because I do, I do as a individual commissioner, but you see my colleagues here, our board is supportive of the work that John is trying to do. And you know, I, he's pointed out, the police officers are trained, they're reacting in, in a very, um, they don't have a lot of information, um, very quickly, and they're doing the best job they can at that moment to protect themselves and protect the public. As we move into the system, we get more opportunities to really get a better understanding of what it is. His attorneys could look at that video a hundred times if they needed. They could slow it down. They could get a better understanding. And so um, recognizing the, the, the work that the police officers are doing in the community to keep us safe and the public safe, but also trusting the system that we are actually responding to those situations with as much information as we have at those points in time in ensuring that justice is served, but ensuring that we are not, um, we've got a long history in our community of overreacting and, and putting people deeper into our system than what was warranted for that crime or that incident. And this is a part of the values of the county board is to ensure that we're being appropriate, justice is served, but we're also not just pushing people deeper into the system because we felt offended, we felt scared. Those are valid feelings and I acknowledge them, but are they valid reasons to push people deeper into our system to use a sledgehammer when we should be using a framing hammer or a tech hammer? And that's why I'm standing up here supporting John. And all, and all I was trying to point out was uh, their point of contention was the gun was pointed at them, therefore they felt right. at the felony level. But you're saying, yeah, gun was pointed at them, nobody's disputing that. I just wanna make sure I report it accurately. Everybody's on the same page. The gun was there. Everybody gets that. However, in Mr. Choi's determination, not to the level of a felony. 
It was not to be a threat or assault. That's yeah. that's all I'm trying to say. Is to, I want to be able to. I want to be able to say both sides agree. Yeah. The gun wanted to point assault. at the officers. Yep. Well, uh, is there a dispute about that, or is there a dispute <laughs> whether the gun? Because well, the gun clearly uh, is up here. Who's it pointed at? I, 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 I just want to make this very clear. So, the the prosecutor handled this case, concluded that the statement that the gun was pointed at a particular officer could not be entirely corroborated by that video. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay. We'll have time later. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.